get the something. The name of our lesson today are trees of righteousness. Now, I believe that God wants us to understand that he uses a lot of symbols, a lot of types, okay? In fact, the Old Testament, if I can describe this in a simplistic way, the Old Testament, all the things that are done, the focus, everything, the, the law, the whole thing was purpose to point everyone to someone, and that someone is Jesus, you see? So in the Old Testament, they were looking forward to the birth of the Messiah, which you and I enjoy today. So I'm going to just give you some practical knowledge with that. And so back then, back in the Old Testament, okay, God, the people desired for God to come and be with them, to tabernacle with them, to have God in their heart. And the condition of mankind was in a such a state that God could only visit them if they required and asked of him. Kind of works today. God wants every human being saved, but not every human being will become saved. And so in the types of shadows of the Old Testament, he uses the illustration of trees or being a tree. And we have already studied in our past that a tree grows in four ways. It grows length, breadth, height, and depth. Or length means endurance. We're enduring through our life, okay? Height, spirituality, depth, stability, and breadth. Breadth is an old English word which means character. We have a God character. Can you aim, say amen? And God is developing in us. And if we allow him... He'll do a wonderful job because he said, once you accepted God, God is at work in you to do his good will and his good pleasure. Can you say amen? So in the Old Testament, if you look at the trees as a type and shadow, say, I'm a tree. I'm a good tree. I'm a God tree. Now you think about all of the illustrations. We are like a branch in a vine. We're trees of righteousness. And you say, man, there's a lot of things. And you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of, you see. And so we can't throw that out. No, God is liking un, uh, to us that his life is working in us. And we need to develop in those four areas. But not only that, we also are a spirit person. We are a spirit man. We have a soul personality. And we dwell in a physical body. Can you say amen? And when Adam and Eve sinned, that went out of phase. They separated from God and later on, 900 years later, died. So the whole thing of the enemy still today is to separate us from a deep, wonderful, solid relationship with God. And from sharing that with other people who need that desperately. Can you say amen? So this is of the Reigning in Life series. So let's go ahead and look at our, our scriptures. Isaiah 61, 3 says this. And he's talking about what Jesus says. It says, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. Isn't that what's supposed to be happening when God's in our heart? The garment of praise, see, we wear God's garment, uh, for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the what? The trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. So see, I'm a tree. You're righteous because you have Jesus, the righteous one in you, and you choose to follow him, you'll make righteous choice, and you'll be the planting of the Lord. So God's put life in here. Now, with a tree, trees have roots. Can you say amen? You use, we were all trees even when we were sinners, when, when we were lost. But our roots were connected to the earth. Now you and I are believers in Christ, and our roots are connected to heaven. We draw our substance from the word and from things above. The Bible says to be cautioned to keep your mind on things above, 
not on things of this earth. Why? Because your roots are no longer attached. Can you say amen? I'm no longer of this world. I may be in it, but my roots are in heaven now. And so we have to learn a whole different way of allowing God to develop and, and develop us. Now, I have a little teeny three foot by three foot garden. It's in a little baby swimming pool. And I grew all kinds of peppers. It grows, it looks like it needs a haircut. And they are flourishing. Good soil, good nutrients, good sun, even though it wasn't a whole lot of sun. And you know, the point I'm making is good nourishments, good relationship with God, lots of praise. You know, these things we soak in. Why? So we may develop up into him like a healthy plant or tree. We're, we're gonna, and so look at Psalms 92. It's again in our scripture up there. I'm going to take a swig here for a minute. The righteous, who's the righteous? Remember, we're trees of righteousness. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. <laughs> God wants you to flourish. We sing a song about thriving. Now, folks, if we still pull our substance and our, our joy and stuff from the roots of the earth, we're going to be disappointed, unsatisfied. But when we pull from God and we meet with God and we fellowship with God and we learn, listen, to abide with the Lord. God will have to teach us because we're jerked around a whole lot by distractions. Teach us how to abide even when we're busy. To abide with him. To include God in everything. Let me tell you, my life has taken on in the last seven years, you know, a richer, deeper walk because of me including God. Now, I'm everywhere I go, God is. So God's omnipresent, and I walk in God, and you walk in God too. But it's the acknowledging and exchange of conversation with God throughout the day that creates the network and the blending that we need to feel secure. Hello, when you get to a point where you get to the point where you're almost addicted to your father's care. It's so much easier to allow that presence to lift your thinking, to lift and cause you to draw. Now listen, the Bible always talks about, especially New Testament, about two sources, old man, new man, old life, new life. Come out from an old life, go into the new life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Creation, all things pass away. Behold, all things become new. Where? In our spirit, man. So God wants you to flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar. That means straight and true. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. Now, that's Old Testament. Let's put it in New Testament. It would kind of read, those who are planted in the presence of the Lord. We are in a house, but this house isn't just where God dwells. He dwells everywhere now. So we're in his presence. But we only become sensitive and aware of his presence when we acknowledge his presence. Oh, I'm in the presence of God. Say that. Oh, I'm in the presence of God. When you pray in the morning, you say, Father, I love your presence. Once you acknowledge what God is, how God operates, it becomes an awareness and you open up to it. You knew that you needed to be saved, but it wasn't until somebody showed you how to pray the prayer of salvation and ask Jesus in your heart that you became aware of what to do. It all works that same way, even in our walk today. And the exciting thing about it is those who are planted in the presence of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age, yay, and they shall be fresh and what? Flourishing. You need to be fresh and flourishing. You're going on a wonderful date with your Lord every morning. You get up, you get with them, and you're in this walk with God. Please. Look at that first part of that last phrase. They shall be fresh. 
Folks, things can get in a rut. I'm not talking about us, but you're above that. But things can be a rut. Keep things fresh and new and exciting. Again, amen. Say amen. And flourishing. God wants you to flourish. Now listen, what has the enemy done to the church? And I, I must say, not against anybody, but some people are just happy to be alive because they're just holding on. And it's sad because they could learn about how God can hold on to them. How they could be with God and how that old stuff can be stripped away and the new stuff with God. You can be educated and things revealed to you. Why? Because you're a child of the living God. Say amen. So I'm excited to share with you what I got. So let's go ahead and look at this. Today we're going to cover these four areas. Number one, make the trees good. That's the whole purpose of Jesus coming. Every human being is an heir of salvation. The Bible says angels have been sent into the earth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. That's you. Now we've already gotten saved, but we still haven't been totally delivered off this planet, have we? So the angels are working with us. If we stop goofing around, flopping about, and start getting into a flow with God, the angels just start getting ahead of you, and they start making the way, and things begin to level out. Are they not sent forth to minister to those? So every human being is a possible heir of salvation. Say amen. But not every human being will accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It is our hope in our prayer, that we can reach as many ourselves as we can by sharing Christ and what God has done in our life with everybody. Oh, yeah, they might get angry. Yeah, they might do all that. But remember, the seed of God never returns to God void. So if you have a chance to tell one of your children or a neighbor that God really loves you and cares about them, they get mad and they slam a door or they cuss at you or something, God forbid, that seed will never leave them. It will never leave them. That means it'll reverberate in their thinking, in their heart, all to the very last breath that they breathe. One plants, another water, but it is God who gives the increase. So don't hold back what you need to be sharing. And, and even if they get upset, keep sharing the word because pretty soon their ding-ding will get it. Everyone smile up at me. A ding-ding? Yeah. Yeah. I felt like I had a pea brain when I was younger. Now I'm saved. I felt I have a, a mind of Christ. Can you say amen? It was a joke. Second thing we'll learn is to dwell in the vine, to, to dwell in the presence of the Lord. We're learning to do that because it's a, it's a type where we learn to be fixed on God. Now, that is not to say you're going to become so holy yet you're no earthly good. What they mean by that is that you don't do anything else but be with God. No, every day through your routines, your gardening, your laughter, being with your children, God needs to be at the forefront so they can sense God in you and want to have what you have. Mama, they need to see a changed life, something different about you. And you have to do that because God says, be a testimony. Grandma, you have to do the same. Grandpa, you know, and I'm pointing at myself, we have to realize that we are surrounded with so many clouds of witnesses. We've got God, the angels. We've got people that have gone on before me. My mom and dad could be looking at me. Hello? This helps us to sober up with the idea. Not only do we have the angels and all that other people that are walking about, our children and others are watching us. But folks, the devil's kind of getting an eye in on us once in a while. He's not always present, but if you get too excited for God, he's going to poke his head in and look, see if he can't slow you down a bit. That's why you don't get distracted. That's why you pay him no mind. That's why a voice of a stranger we will not follow. Can you say amen? We're going to be sensitized and exercised in godliness so that we are tuned in, turned on, tuned up, and we can change people's lives. Say amen. That's who we are. And then 
we need to have the right choices. Do you know the right choices bring you to the right fruit? Can you say amen? The right choices bring the fruitful life. And then fourthly, growing up into him, solid and unmoved. And that's what we want to do, hopefully. We get you in the word of God and you stand upon the word. Say amen. So first point, make the trees good. Go with me, Matthew 12, 33. I didn't want to bore you with my paragraph, so I skipped it. Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good. Now, remember, we're liking human beings unto tree because actually Jesus is. And remember, he's looking at two kinds of humans. He's looking at the Jewish nation, those who need to be born again, that are serving God and following God, and those that are Gentiles without God. Only, he only saw two, Jews, non-Jews, Jews, Gentiles. Say amen. Now he sees everybody. Why? Because his covenant to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Amen. So either make the tree good, get them saved, and its fruit good, what they do, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its what? So if you know somebody producing all kinds of garbage, Bible says, don't eat that fruit. You might digest a worm. In other words, stay away from that. Come out from among them. Know the human being by what's around their life, what, what they do, what they say, because that's the fruit that they're producing. My, my, my. No, this is Jesus. He says, you want to know what's good and bad? Our job is to discern good from evil. Either make the tree saved and good or let it be bad, but don't hang around it. Say amen. Then in Matthew 7, look at this. 15 through 20, beware of false prophets. Now, what is a false prophet? Those that speak and they speak the wrong things opposite to what God wants spoken. That would be a false prophetic prophet. Now, our job is not to discern who's good or who's bad as far as a prophet goes, because we're not to look at flesh, but instead to listen to what is said. Is it good, edifying, exhortation, and comforting? Or is it completely false? You know a tree by the... And so there were false prophets back then at the time of Jesus, and they preached many damnable heresies into the body. So he goes on and he says, beware of false prophets, those who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Have you ever ran into one? Looked good, smelled good, but something bad inside. Now you're not judging them that way. That's just the fruit they produce. You will know them by their what? Fruits. Notice got an S on it. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, well, period. I'll stop it right there. I'm going to go on, but I want to stop right there. It should be able to tell, because God lives in you, who to be with, who to share with, how to keep out of trouble. Can you say amen? Even if you have weakness in your flesh, like maybe you're wrestling with losing weight or you have another issue that you want to just overcome, you have to do it in the realm of the spirit. Can you say amen? So look at the rest of this, how it, how it lays it out. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. What? Wow. Nor does a, nor bear good fruit, excuse me, can bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. In other words, you can tell a human intends to be good. Now, this is before anybody's born again. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? Wow. Cut off, cut down, and thrown into the, now, we won't go into detail, but there's a little reminder, 
okay? Not to, not to hammer on that, but you do need to know that there is a real literal hell, and it's under your feet, and the Bible says that it is. And we believe it only because the Bible says it is, not because we wish it wasn't or it is or whatever. That's wishy-washy, ooh, you know, making up things because it makes you feel comfortable. No, no, no. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. What is Jesus? What was the first words of Jesus to his disciples before he left? Be careful in these days that no man deceive you. Right? So I come to share it. I say, well, you know what? You could have much more. Pretend I'm not the pastor. You could have a better life if you went to the church down the street. I know Pastor Kerry, and, you know, that's all right. There's no band. There's no nothing. You need some excitement in your life. Now, would that be from God or not? You'd have to be able to discern if that was right or wrong. And a lot of people today, they don't have the spiritual discernment. Remember, those that are living on milk cannot discern. Okay? But those of, of, of full age have their senses exercised to discern good from evil. And that's you. Amen? So you should be able to discern conversation, how it leads, where it's leading. For example, question. Somebody asks a question of God. is a legitimate question. Or is it a question to make you trip up on what you say you say? Well, if God is so cool, then what, who did Cain marry? He says, look it up for yourself. I know who he married. You do? Yeah. Do you know his son, Jesus? Do you know Jesus? You get back to the, the, get out of the foolishness and get back to the point. There are a lot of lost people and all they want to do is argue how well they want to stay lost. And they'll tell you things like, no politics and no religion, please. And you look at them and say, shoo, I'm not religious either. Let's share about Jesus. Hello? Okay, I'm just messing with you a little bit. So one more scripture. Look what Matthew 3.10 tells us. All under the guides of make the trees good. And verse 10 says, and even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree, the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Now, this is John the Baptist speaking. Remember, they came out to see John, how he's doing. Who are you? Who are you? Are you one? Uh, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I'm a voice is crying in the wilderness. Make you straight the path of the Lord. Hello? And he says, you, why did you come out to see me? The axe of the, is laid at the root of your trees. Remember, the Jewish people weren't born again. And a lot of them were doing evil in the name of good. And their roots were of the earth. They're pulling from the earth. And the only thing good that comes out of the earth is trying to be good. We can't just try to be good. So our roots are in heaven. We're born again. We're in the New Testament. So if you relate too much of the Old Testament and you don't keep it in the light of the new, then you'll feel like, oh, well, God needs to show up. God, come down and bless me kind of stuff. Sounds really good. Except for, guess what? He lives in your heart. I always make fun. I love those songs. God, come and hold my hand. Take the wheel, Jesus. I love those songs. But those are emotional shipwreck songs. They're not worship songs. They're testimony emotional songs that you can identify. Oh, yes, I know what I ran my life. Now Jesus has got the wheel. <laughs> That's a mess. Get in the word of God. Now, I'm not picking on anybody, but emotions and unstable bit, running off of God on your ability to think how he is, is not good enough. We need the word. Say amen. All right, look at a couple of questions. Church, this is why we share Jesus to everyone. By receiving Jesus Christ into their hearts, our hearts, our roots are changed from earth to heaven. Say amen. So it, point two, so we are going into all the world to as many as God told us to touch them, to lead them to Christ if we can, to have their nature changed, making the tree good instead of the tree being bad. 
And anybody could be saved if they call on the name of the Lord. Third point, this also helps us determine who's of God and who's not. Did you know there's a lot of people, even back then, that were supposedly of God, but were not? And how do you tell them if their life is not centered around Jesus Christ and they're born again? Then I would question. Now, I have to do a lot of studying, and I do do a lot of studying, on the different things that are out there, how far along we're coming as a human race, socially too. But that's all just, I don't take any of my nourishment from that. It just feeds my ability to answer people's questions. And again, I told you a long time ago, I was at Green River, River Community College, and I was asked to be the Bible answer man. And for three summers in a row, I answered Bible questions to the people that came. And you know, college students have some wild questions. One thing that you need to know about a question is the motive behind the asking. If they really want to know, give them an answer. I usually say, why do you ask the question? Oh, I just wanted to argue with you. I believe it's different. Those I never answer. I just smile and say, hey, that's all right. But arguing is what God says is not to do because it feeds the devil. So don't be an arguer. Just live God out. Let God be who he is and shine. Amen. All right. And fifth, fourthly, in sharing Jesus, we must do it in love. For truly the harvest is already ready, but there's too few ones sharing. We need to pray for those out there in, in front of everybody, leading thousands to the Lord, the Billy Graham types. Amen. And pray for the pastors of local churches, you know, and in this area, you know, the church in the Northwest seems very moody and very unforgiving at times. We need to be accepting and loving. There's a lot of wounded Christians out there that need to be brought back into fellowship with God. And you might be the very one that helps them see the real Jesus, the one that Jesus was, is, and always will be in the Testaments. Amen. All right, let's go, go to point two. You can hear my voice. I sang it out this morning. Was that think, sing your lungs out? I didn't do that. All right, so dwelling in the vine under his care. Now, we all know what the Bible says. Abide in the vine, amen? So let's read it, John 15. If you got sometimes another more modern translation, you can read this along with this, and you'll see some wonderful things, okay? But don't lose the nature of Christ and don't lose the purpose of him coming and the plan of rescue, redemption for us. I am the true vine, he says, and my father owns the world. He's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Whatever it is, they're going to get pruned. If you're loving God, God's going to prune you. If you're, you're hating God, you're going to get pruned. Because even life itself will tumble and turn you and things will chip away in the world. But you're not of the world. You're in Christ. So the master gardener is going to keep you clean, trimmed, and efficient. Say amen. Amen. So to think that, oh, I'll never get pruned because, you know, I'm pleasing God. No, the more fruit you produce, the more God wants to prune you and make you even more excellent. The idea is nobody stays the way they are. God's always trying to advance us into and up into his son. Say amen. So you can't sit there and feel sorry for yourself. You can't sit there and go, woe is me. Why? Because God wants to advance us into a greater walk with him. How many here want to go? Then we need to follow Jesus, not walk around him and not run off the path. Just kind of a little side note. You guys are wonderful. So he says, and you are the branches. Every branch, again, that does not bear fruit, 
He takes away every branch that bears fruit. He prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now he says to his disciples, you already are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Did you know when the word comes out with the anointing, it's Jesus himself coming out. Hello. And by receiving that word, you're being washed by the water of his word. And Jesus says right here, you're clean. You've been sitting around listening to my word for this while. This word has cleansed you, got you in right thinking, got you into the right place where you'll eventually accept me into your heart. That's why pastors and good teachers of the word will encourage you to get in the word every day so it washes you, sets you, kind of cleans you. Say amen. He says, you are already clean. Now, verse 4 says, stay, abide in me, and I in you. Allow me to abide in you. Now, he's talking the future. Nobody's born again yet. Remember that. But he's talking New Testament. Jesus always talked New Testament. He talked the Old Testament. You've heard that if you, somebody, you, you can divorce your wife. But I say unto you, if you even, see, Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament, law, you can get away with almost anything because you need Jesus anyway. And then the New Testament, you can't get away with that because it has to do with the condition of your motive in your heart. Different. So guess what? I have a beautiful wife, so I don't lust after women because they're naturally attractive. You are married, or you might have something your heart is pure, so you don't lust in the old world life. Why? Because it's in our flesh. Crucify it. Crucify it. Not crucify him. Crucify your flesh. All right. Let's kind of have fun with you. So he says, abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Why? Because you need the God juices. You need God's very juice and power working in you. Your roots have changed. You've been grafted into the wild vine. Can you say amen? His name is Jesus. We need to abide there so the juices get all through us and we produce fruit and leaves and life and we thrive. Can you say amen? And you'll see a lot of Christians, and this is really hard to say, that aren't thriving because they're not spending the time with God like they should. They need those juices running, the wisdom of God, all the presence of God operating. Can you say amen as well? Inside us. So Jesus, are you going to learn to abide in my vine, in me? Amen. Okay. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Okay, then he goes down, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, you're just automatically going to produce fruit. Why? Because it's God doing the fruit in us. He's coming out of you. Instead of being crabby and disrespectful, you're going to be happy and, and respectful. It's got to be the fruit of God coming. Why? You, you've got to abide. Bears much fruit, he says, and without me, you can do nothing. So without the juices of God and our abiding with him, there is none of that presence that we need so desperately and backs the devil off so wonderfully. And if anyone does not abide in me, what happens? You wither. This is really what Jesus is saying. In the beginning, remember the bush that Moses saw? You ever wonder why that bush did what it did? It was like a, a bush with many branches, but it was on fire but not consumed. That was a symbol of God's outreach, his kingdom. God being in the center of that bush, but his branches were this outreach. Now, in the beginning of all the beginning, there was no evil. It all was of God. And then one branch, his name was Lucifer, and now he is Satan, the devil, decided to break off of that tree, and he still was a branch of God, but he was a dead branch full of death. So what did he do? He infected another branch called the human race. And he went to the start of it and corrupted Adam and Eve 
and another branch broke off, humanity. But see, God sent his son, the last Adam, so that we who accept him, we who accept him, Jesus in our heart, we are grafted by God's divine presence back into Christ. And we are accepted in him as if we never broke away. So that's why you need to abide with God so those juices come out of you. It influences your thoughts, your speech. Come on, come on, this is good stuff. Well, yes, Pastor Kerry, I know these things. Yeah, but are you these things? Do you do, are you these things? You know, you're an expression of God. You're a little branch. And God wants to grow a whole bunch of lot of fruit on this little branch. Can you say amen? But it's not going to grow if it's half broken. Huh? Come on. See, that's not me. I thrive with Jesus. So here's another thing. Once we've changed this, look at it, go says, if anyone does not abide, so we just choose to abide, say amen. If you abide in me, my words, see, that's why we consult the word, helps our thinking. Abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be what? Done for you. By this we know, by this my Father is glorified that you bear what? So the only way we can is being with God. Can't do it on your own. And yet there are wonderful Christians out there doing works and they're doing this and they're going this way and that. We don't know the condition of their heart. Hopefully they're doing it with God and they're bearing great fruit. Say amen. Our job is not to judge them. All right, so we can find out a couple of things. Number one, we have been wonderfully and fearfully made. and But even more than that, our Heavenly Father has wonderfully and powerfully produced a protectional walk where you and I can walk where the enemy can't get to us if we'll master that walk. And the only way we can master that walk is to follow Jesus. Not to live for Jesus, but to follow Jesus. It's okay to live for him, but if you're living for him outside of following him, it's just religion. Make sure you're following Jesus. He's prompting you to do, not do certain things. So he becomes the bishop and the shepherd of our soul. Secondly, God is at work in us. We're the New Testament. You have Jesus in your heart. Let him work. He's after your good. He's begun a good work in you. He will finish that work. He can do exceedingly above it anything we ask or think. Let him work. Say amen. You know what's neat about God? He just works. Let him work. Oh, God, please help me. And God says, I've been trying to. Would you please take your body to me and then lay it at my feet so I can keep it out of the way? Say amen. See, there are some things that we have to do involving our walk, but not very much and certainly not hard at all. Thirdly, the fruit of our labor is producing others like ourselves. How about you? Are you producing people like yourself? Now, you can't make them go to your church, but you can get them born again. Amen. Make sure they confess that Jesus is their Lord. So would you like to pray a prayer with me? Well, I don't know. Just pray with me. Father, Father, come into my heart. Come into my heart, Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. Just lead them on the way. If you give a person a chance to get out because of the sin in them, they'll want to get out. Never say to somebody, would you like to pray the sinner's prayer? And they go, well, no. He says, come on, we can do it. Because most of the time, they don't know what to say. Don't let sin speak for them. Everyone say, I got it, Pastor Kerry. All right, let's go to our third, our third point. Right choices bring a fruitful life. Can you say amen? In Deuteronomy uh, chapter 30, verse 19 through 20, I tried to read real quickly. This is dealing with the old covenant, the blessings and the cursings. In the Old Testament, they had to follow God by faith, but they had to walk in the blessings. If they did anything wrong, got into the world, they would reap the cursings. 
Hello. The Bible tells us, so we understand, that we have been purchased away from the cursings or redeemed from the curse. That means we're in Christ. So the curses will not be ours. And they are three major ones, poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. If you're poor and, and barely getting along, that is not God's blessing. Find out how you can get in the word and follow after God so he can give you a raise. Hello? He's the one that prospers us anyway, isn't he? Okay, so it goes. In verse third, uh, 19, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Good, good suggestion, God. Oh, man, that's good. Both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, the voice of a shepherd they will follow, and that you may cleave to him or cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days. Now, that's Old Testament. But that's where, how the Israelites got so blessed. They tried their best to do this, and God blessed them. But look what Psalms chapter 1, 1 through 3 tells us. Again, Old Testament, but let's put it to the New Testament. Blessed is the man. Say amen. Amen who walks not in the counsel of the world, the ungodly. Well, people say, and people say it's going to be this way when I get older, and they say this, and they, who are they? And how dare you think they are better than him? You see, we don't want to be doing that. I'm just kind of teasing with you. Bless, that walks not in the counsel of them, God, nor stands in the path of sinners. That means acting just like them. And also getting in the way for them coming to know the Lord. Nor sits in the seat of the what? Scornful. Today we see a lot of scorners making fun, making jokes, putting things down, not respecting their elders, people in authority. And that's scorning, and God hates it. That's something that Satan does to the human being. You know, somebody that comes to you and they just tell you how beautiful you look and everything, and when they walk away, they go, yeah, well, that person, I don't know if they know, and then they scorn them. That's, that's the thorns and thistles that God said should not be in a Christian because no one picks sweet figs and fruit from your branch if you're going to scorn them or you're going to sting them or poke them. Come on, laugh with me. And that's what the Jewish people as a nation were doing. They slipped into that religious realm. I'm not picking on it, but this is, you know, this is God talking to us. He doesn't want us to be thorny. He wants us to be fruity. Look at your neighbor and say, you look like a fruity person. Make sure you say fruity. Okay. Are you having fun with me? Then it tells us, it says, but his delight is in the law or the principles of the Lord, New Testament. And his principles, he meditates day and night. In other words, let's get God's mind on some things. What would Jesus do? Can you say amen? He shall be like a what? Ah, uh, here we go, trees. This person shall be like a tree planted by God near the what? Oh, you're never going to get dry. I want God to plant me. I want God to help me. I want God to lead me. I want God to give me his wisdom. I want God to line up my steps. I want God to lift me up so that he lifts me up and no enemy in the world can touch us. I want to walk so well with God that I'm with my shepherd. I want to be like John, which says I am Jesus' favorite. Peter, you're second. 
you, I got shotgun. In other words, to so close to God that you and God become friends. And he lets you in on the secrets of heaven. He lets you on in the masteries of how the things work, how to get hands and lay hands on the sick, how to walk in the miracles. God needs more people like that and your people like that. Now get up and do some things about it. Don't sit there and think it's your last time. Get your second breath. Amen. Whew, sorry the preach came on me. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. There's four seasons for a Christian. We'll talk about that some other time. Whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall what? Now you match that up to James, and James says, he that becomes a doer of the word is blessed in what he's doing. Wow. See, that's me. And let's go down to just a couple of points. Those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how easy it is. Our nature then becomes changed and our roots pull from God. We're solid in him. Two, we are to remain in Christ, the tank. We're not going to ever lose that teaching. But see, you're in Jesus. You're in a tank that has already crushed the enemy. Now you've got a stripped devil who all he has is lies and is really good at telling them an ability to tantalize our flesh for the purpose of getting us out of Christ, out of the tank, and down on his level. That's where Paul says, listen, I've been on his level. I've been religious. Now, you who are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Stay in your tank. Look at the equipment that God has given you. Use the missileage and the bombage and the ways to fight the devil so that you're not involved. You just release Jesus. Jesus becomes then a bomb. He's smart enough to know what to do if you will send him in Jesus' name. Father, I send you into so-and-so's life. I command you to go in. You know what they need mentally, physically, and spiritually. Bring them to a place where they hear the word, where they can be saved. And Lord God, if they're causing mischief, that will cease and desist. And Lord, I release your angels to bind them up and make sure they are open to you in Jesus' name. Now, if you don't know and you can't memorize all that, go back and listen to this. You're very powerful as a believer. There's more power in you because of Jesus than anything the enemy could ever think of. The problem is we think we have to do all this. No, stay in the tank, use the equipment, do lots of praise, lots of things that keep you centered on Christ and God will see that your whole unit, tank and all, Go wherever you go, and you go where he goes. Say amen. How do I stay in the, in the tank? Father, in Jesus' name, don't let me leave here. Teach me how to abide, how to dwell. Teach me how to be comfortable in your presence, God. Those who dwell in the house in the presence of God shall flourish even in old age. Amen. They shall be fresh. My last point. Growing up into him, solid and unmoved. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Again, something very familiar. The idea is I want you to see that God puts fivefold ministry in the body to bring stability. So you need a pastor. You need an apostle. You need those who really teach and preach the word of God. But you might be one of those. You might develop into one of those. Hello? The sky's the limit now. Don't limit, oh, I'll never be. There you go. God might have some wonderful plans. Let's find them and let's live them. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping, that's you, of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come into unity of the faith, 
of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature or perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, this, that, you never know what God's going to do, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, be not deceived by men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but learn to speak the truth in love, that you may grow up in all things into him, into him who is the head, even Christ. When you grow up into Christ, you grow up into the awesome, most important authority that ever could be in this planet. The idea is to be more like him so that you have more authority and you can move the devil out of this place. Hello? Did you know you can back the devil off your family? But you have to have a strategic plan laid out by God. A list of their names how you're going to pray for them, how you're going to alter them, and bombard them in your tank every day. Oh, Lord, I thank you that you're saving my kids. And you name them. Thank you, Lord, you're bringing God and revelations and friends that know how to talk to them about the Lord Jesus. You Thank you, God. It only takes a few minutes. Some of you have a lot of kids. Some of us have a lot of grandkids. It's fun. Because every time you do that, you're getting more ground and you're pushing the devil farther and farther away. Second Peter chapter 1, look at 5 through 11. Again, I have to read quickly. But also for this very reason. Now, you as a born-again believer, we need to give all diligence, get after it. We need to add to our faith in God how to look virtuous in knowledge. Don't look stupid. To knowledge... How to self-control. Don't overeat. Don't do those things that Satan can use against you and kill you with. It might even could be a jelly bean. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Swallowed a sack of jelly beans. Hello. And your knowledge, self-control, self-control, perseverance, endurance, into perseverance, godliness. Stick with it. Be piety. Don't be a vacillating snob. In godliness, brotherly kind. Be kind to others. And to brotherly kindness, love. God's love. That's God's copy love. For if these things are yours, say they're mine, and they're in me. Say they're in me. But you got to let them out. And they abound. You will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ. Nor he who, so he though, who forgets, lacks these things, have forgotten even to blindness, and forgotten that he's been cleansed. Listen, have you ever met a mean Christian? They've forgotten how much they've been forgiven. Mercy, mercy, merciful, forgiving. Can you say amen? I have people who are mad at me for whatever reason, and they refuse, and yet I let them to the Lord, help their lives out. You know. So you can't go on that. It doesn't bother me all that much. I just wish they would grow up. Frankly, just grow up. Here, let me, let me show you what not to do while you're preaching. Toro, Toro. I knocked out my little cover. That was just for fun. If you don't have fun, I tell you. Are you still with me? And he said that you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord. Now listen, for he will ask these things short-sighted. You've forgotten. Even unto blindness. Now, Verse 10 says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. See, that's the hour we live. We have to be diligent to get after it, to make your call and election sure. How do we be sure? He listens to me. She'll dwell safely and be quiet of fear of evil, secure. And for if you do these things, you'll neither be stumble. Do you see the word stumble there? There's a lot of people, and I'm not referring to anybody you know. But all over the world are stumbling because Jesus is not their surety. I'm not talking about physically tripping or falling over something. I'm not doing that. I'm talking about stumbling in their walks because they're not solidly secure in their relationship of what to do and how to stay in the tank. And so they're out there fighting a battle and they're trying to hold on to faith and they're getting knocked down all the time. So remember, I'm not pointing out that you might have fallen. 
I'm pointing out the fact that we don't want to fall away from our position in Christ. Okay, say amen. God says, therefore, so after you do these things, you will not even stumble. For so an entrance shall be supplied to you abundantly where? An entrance to the everlasting kingdom. What is he talking about? He's saying, I will open up all the treasures of heaven to you, and you'll be able to get a guided tour, and God will teach you as the Holy Spirit has been spoken of. He will guide you into all truth. He will reveal what Jesus has said in his kingdom, what you're to do. But that comes to those whose hearts are fixed on God, whose mind is stayed on him. Isaiah 26, 3 says, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. First Peter 5, First John 5, 18 says, he that's born of God keeps himself and the wicked one touches him not. Amen? So there is a walk that we can get to. There is a walk that we can enjoy. And so walk that gives us hope and gives us faith. But in order to do it, there's some things that we're required to do. Present ourselves daily to God. Pal up with God throughout the day. Acknowledge him throughout the day. Make sure that we're not caught up in bitterness and frustrations of the world. Make sure our mouth is in order. Because out of our mouth can be sweet or bitter water. Make sure the bitterness dies out. The sweetness grows up. And let me ask you this. Was this a blessing today to you? All right. Give the Lord a praise.